Well, we are joined today by Daniel Stockhammer, who is Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Ottawa, and Axel Sundström, who is Associate Professor and Senior Lecturer at the Department of Political Science at the University of Gothenburg. And we are going to have a conversation about your book from last year, from 2022, titled Youth Without Representation, the Absence of Young Adults in Parliaments, Cabinets and Candidacies. Um, to get straight into things, uh, I would like to invite you both to share a little bit about your motivation for this research on youth participation and, of course, specifically your focus on parliaments. Um, I don't know who would prefer to start. Daniel, um, why don't you go ahead? Hey, thank you. I mean, Axel and I, we have worked quite extensively before on questions on representation, questions of women's representation, but then we have moved slowly into youth representation and we found this is an area that's really very very little done but also an area that's very interesting and important to study because of all out groups youth are probably one of the out groups that's most underrepresented compared to women minorities and uh, and uh, lgbtq for example so uh, the motivation was also i mean accent like it's a topic that has brought us together over the last uh, 10 years. So we wrote a couple articles and then we thought, why don't we bring this into a book and have something comprehensive and have something to, yeah, I mean, lead the discipline in this, in, in, in this area, because this is the first book comprehensively on youth representation. So uh, it's basically the culmination of a couple articles which we started in 2018, then we had some in 2019, 2020, and then slowly emerged the idea of the book and the, uh, yeah, basically the book is, I would say, a little bit the, the culmination of what, also what we did before, brought this together, added different layers, added parliaments, cabinets, also added um, some more in-depth surveys on different countries. So to, to have it as much comprehensive as possible, and we thought this was also missing in our scholarship. Axel, anything to add? Yes, uh, thanks for inviting us. I, I think we're quite pleased to be here and talk about this topic. And I think that sort of unites me and Daniel that we are quite passionate about this topic. And, and in this statement, I think it looms some type of normative claim that we are quite, I guess we were interested in this topic because we felt that there has been, it is actually a democratic deficit in how societies are governed today, that we, we, we have done the observation that societies are kind of governed by a type of political class individuals that that are elected, of course, but they tend to be not descriptively very representative of the general population. And I think this is an observation that scholars have been doing for the last decades that we know that politicians tend to be male, they tend to be much more educated, richer, and oftentimes from the ethnic majority group. But I think the fundamental problem that we observed is that people are in, in power are much older than their citizens. And this is what we wanted to raise to the agenda. And I think this, this is the main contribution that we're making to really point to this is the problem and young adults are not very present in politics. So this is kind of um, the big motivation why we wanted to do this book, I think. Well, I think we we share your motivation uh, in that absolutely. And before we get to um, the democratic deficit that you've you've already hinted at, could you just clarify what age groups are you looking at in in this piece of research? Because of course, youth is defined but not defined. What 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 do you understand by young people when you talk about your research here? Well, I, I guess we are interested in adults and younger adults, and it's not a, an absolute limit. I would say we have being pragmatic and we're rested on others that tries to define this as more or less people below the age of 35 or even 40. And we tend to give some examples that we have so few politicians of this age group. So whether or not we define it in, in terms of 35 years or 40, there's still a very, um, there's still a scarcity of young adults, so to say. Absolutely. Maybe if I may add, and it's also very conservative because we look at the beginning of each parliament or each cabinet. So that means by the end, MPs or representatives are four to five years older. I mean, that's also what we have to keep in mind. This is really the most conservative way of looking at it. And if we look, say, okay, there are, I don't know, 
young adults aged uh, 35 and under in this parliament, it means at the beginning. At the end, it might be five, three, or maybe even nobody. So this yeah. is also what we have to keep in mind. Absolutely. And, and of course, I think to a lot of people, it sounds strange to even consider someone at the age or close to the age of 45 as a young member of parliament, right? Or close to the age of 40. I think if you speak to a lot of young people around the ages of, of 18 or 20, that already is, is quite a stretched uh, definition, of course. But that is a definition that is often used and that, that we, of course, uh, use as well. Yeah, um, yeah, and just to add to this, Lolly, I think if we were to only study those below the age of 25, we wouldn't find that many politicians. So yeah. it's more of an empirical observation. Yeah, um, and a pragmatic think... decision, as, as you say, to I mean, be it, able to it, look it, at that group. I think it's also pragmatic because, for example, if you look at parliaments, you can do some analysis with age 35 and under. But if you look at the cabinets, I mean, there's basically nobody. 70% of the cab uh, of the cabinets we have looked at had nobody. So that also makes sense. To Then you have to, in order to make some um, meaningful analysis, you have to kind of expand it. And so even 40 for cabinet is the only way that it actually works analytically to do some analysis because I think it's in our book, it's 71% of cabinets have nobody age 35 or under. So that's something to, to also to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with that, you've introduced uh, my, my first main question really, which is about the, the title of your book, Youth Without Representation. Um, the Interparliamentary Union refers to young citizens as an excluded uh, majority, which is an interesting turn of phrase. And you've already hinted, uh, both of you, at, at how you see youth representation uh, or youth without representation, as I should say. Uh, so what does your research uh, show concretely when it comes to the representation of young people in Parliament? Actually, you want to go ahead? Please. So, so the observation we're making... And that is kind of the motivation for research is that the demographic composition of citizens across the globe is not mirrored in the composition of parliaments. So there is a huge discrepancy that parliaments tend to be composed by individuals much older than the average voter. So there is a discrepancy of those going to election day and voting for politicians and those actually ending up in parliament. And um, in our book, we are departing from this observation. We have collected our own data to measure this, and mm -hmm. we try to make inferences on mapping uh, the rates of youth representation in different countries and try to explain why we find a variance across countries, but also within parties. So that is more line the larger goal we have. Yeah. Daniel, anything you would like to add? Yeah, maybe to give you some numbers. I mean, the if you look at 35 or under, there's an underrepresentation of one to three. If you look all, if you look at all parliaments in the in the world, and if you look at cabinets, it's about one to ten. Yeah. If we compare to the voting age population, that's only the voting age. So if we compare, let's say 35 to 18, uh, 18 to 35 in the population, and 18 to 35 in parliament, it's again one about uh, roughly one to three, and in cabinets one to ten. So this is kind of to give you some some benchmark of, and of course there are some countries like the US where it's much, or India or Japan, where the gap is even much, much bigger. But it's yeah. also, and this includes, I mean, and, it, and what's also interesting because we also talk about democracy that also hints at the democratic deficit, the democracies don't do any better in youth representation than non-democracy. So if we want to look at the ideas of a, that the democracy should ideally give equal chances to everyone and represent them equally, we would see that, uh, I mean, it's not the case with young people. And especially in some of the long, lasting democracies we, we see especially a big gap between the age i mean the prime example is the us between the age our average age of the representative and the average age in the population and of yeah. course we see or and, and then when we look at the developing countries where let's say half the population is 30 or under there's also a really really huge gap so we also have to keep in mind where we talk to because um, i mean the young or how the, the age pyramid is very much different in many different countries. And so that's why we also added a second measure um, in some other work where we look at basically how is the representation gap of young people in parliament compared to the population. And then we have kind of a measure, for example, if it's 0.2, that means the, the it's 20, it's 20%. 20 if it's 0.5, it's half. And so, and, and, and I think that's, if we use this measure, we get an even bigger gap. 
So if we compare, uh, if we look at basically relative terms, relative to the population instead of absolute terms, we even get a much bigger representation in a lot of a lot, in, in a lot of countries because in some, especially developing countries, the age pyramid. I mean, in some African countries, the median age is 22 years old, and then uh, the average age or the median age in Parliament is like 55. So to just uh, to, to to just give you some benchmarks. Yeah. Hmm. And what explains that, according to your uh, your research? What are some of the factors that you can that you can point to that that that, that can account for, for for this democratic deficit, as you call it? And and are those factors similar across countries, or do you see clear regional trends? What's uh, what's come across? I I think what what is striking is that most countries tend to have this problem. I think this really is something we need to stress. That there's only a handful of countries where we find youth to be present in par with their share of the population. So in most countries, you, you tend to see this problem, but there's variation. So we have found that if we think of country variation, mm -hmm. uh, having an electoral system that is more proportional, that tends to decrease the average age in a parliament. Um, and also one thing that is possibly more uh, that could be changed more easily is uh, legal rules to run for office. So we find that those countries that has legal rules, say, hindering those below the age of 25, those countries tend to be much more um, difficult to penetrate for, for young uh, adults entering office. So they have a higher uh, mean age and it's quite striking, I, I would say you would. Um, if those models were to predict a policy change, we would find uh, uh, several years younger parliament if those rules were to be dismantled, so to say. Yeah. Daniel? I would say there's also, and this is harder to grasp, but for example, through our survey research and so other type of research, we find that the informal rules, I mean, yeah, you need networks, you need experience, and there's the idea that um, you need to work your way up. So there are um, really entrenched rules, I would say, that prevent young people from from running, and if they do run, I mean, we have some Evidence, for example, that if they get nominated, they get nominated to seats where they have little chance of winning, or they get uh, in, in, rather on the uh, far end of the uh, of, of party list. So there's really, I would say, in most parties or in most implicit and sometimes explicit, I wouldn't call it discrimination, but clear disadvantages in the process of running. So I mean, young people first, have, it's harder for them to run because they don't have the networks, don't have the money, also financial resources. Mm -hmm. And then if they run, they often don't get an equal playing field to run. So I think that's, and this is really entrenched in the system. And it's entrenched in the system that, uh, I mean, most politicians, I, um, I did some service in Canada. They don't see it as a problem that uh, young people don't run. And they see it, it should be the way it is, that uh, that uh, experience is a strong tool to to uh, or a strong asset that they count. So there's... um. And I think that was basically why I think it won't change in the medium and long run. As long as the culture doesn't change, it's very hard because what we also find in the models, I mean, what Axel said, the, I mean, the candidate requirements to run, age requirements to run, PR, they matter. And also the age of the party leader, but only to a certain degree. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them, I mean, we don't explain the, a lot of this variation by country level factors. And that's what we hone, why we honed in into like more, okay, what's the structure of parties? What's the climate of parties? What's the political culture? And there we really see that um, there's an entrenched culture of, um, of favoring politicians with experience. There's an entrenched culture that young people need to work their way up. And, 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 and there's an entrenched of informal networks, which are formed by senior politicians, which one young people have, have, have difficulties accessing. So this, this, um, I mean, this culture is entrenched in a lot, a lot of, of, of parties and a lot, a lot of environments. And also even for those who make it, about half of them even report that they've experienced what they call discrimination on the way up. So even those few young people that make it, a lot of them say, well, we didn't find an equal playing field. So this, 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 um, and there's even in the population, I mean, there, 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 this idea that, I mean, young, politics is for the, I mean, I, I, I or even an academic, I, I presented a youth paper at the World Congress of Political Science just last, last month. And one of the audience told me, 
um, young people should be actors and old people should be politicians because they have the experience. So this is really entrenched, even among some academics, I would say. It's, so, 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 so to break, I, it will be very, very difficult to break this culture. And I, and if you also see, I mean, if you look at other outgroups, they've made big strides in the last couple of years. I mean, we are far away from equal representation for women, but if you look at the last decade or the last two decades, it has doubled or at least double. Um, other, I mean, minority representation is on the agenda, has in, improved in many countries, but youth representation, if at all, has st stagnated or even reclined. And so this is also something we need to see that there's over the last 50 years, 20 years, no improvement whatsoever, if at all, has gone the other way, the other way around. So this is also something we have to keep in mind, makes the problem even stricter. But there is also no, think about all the activism that was necessary to change representation patterns for women there isn't this activism is not there for young people i mean scholarship is still scarce it's 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 developing but if you look at how many newspapers you find and how many p papers on other outgroups it's still a, a very tiny portion and in the political sphere sphere i mean there's no interest to really change the status quo there's no interest of old people stepping aside and leaving the seat for young people there and i mean brings it also the incumbency advantage it's another uh, an, another big issue we have um that, I mean, in a lot of countries, 80, 90% get reelected over many, many years, gerrymandering. So there's no interest of older people stepping aside and leaving their seat for younger for younger people. And so the, the situation will not change in the long run, in the medium run. In the long run, we don't know, but not, not, not in the next foreseeable future. Axel, did you want to add anything to that? Story? Well, I think the, the debate in the US at the moment is quite interesting, and I think it it illustrates a problem that many political elites are facing. How will they renew themselves? And I think uh, the president of the US now is um, arguably quite old in the eyes of the voters. And this party has faced a lot of challenges, face, face, um, coming up with new candidates that appear to be having merit yet not too old. And I think that's illustrative that these political elites, they are not really able to uh, meet that requirement. Yeah. And on the other hand, we have some very successful examples, say in Finland, the last prime minister, or in New Zealand, very young, competent um, individuals that has done a, a I, I think, very good job. Uh, so, so I don't think there's, yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, that the problem is the young candidates, so to say. <laughs> No, I, I mean, if, if I may add, because that's also one of the stereotypes. Oh, there's not enough young people to run. I mean, this is absolutely not true. I mean, you, you know, you need in, in order you have like 400 seats in a country. So you need if you if you want to fill, I don't know, 100 seats with young people you need 100, 200 candidates. So there's always enough candidates to run. And um, it's it's it, it's just a pretext to 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 to. To, uh, to 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 not nominate them or to not, but they are, that's absolutely that is one of the big myths that people oh there's not enough young people to run I mean this is up to if they were, you were to approach young people young people have are more competent than ever education rates are more are higher than ever they 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 access in the professional world faster than ever so it's it it, it cannot be that then there are not young enough young candidates if they would be approached or anything to run so this is also something we need to really make clear to any audience that i mean this is just a pretext when politicians say this to to save the status quo but it has nothing to do with reality so the young people out there they are not making it into parliament they are definitely not making it into cabinet that is that is what you find in your in your research what is the impact of that like what do we lose by not getting those young people those good qualified uh, young people with new ideas and new ways of doing things into our institutions what what do you see as the the big problem that results from from that current status quo I think we, we should view this as having instrumental effects in the sense that policy decisions might actually be different when we have young people or the absence of young people. So, I mean, policies to tackle climate change, etc., might be different uh, based on the composition of legislators. So there's a couple of studies coming out showing that policies are actually different based on who's making them. Then we also have, I guess, the more symbolic effect that it matters if the voters can see that those in office do not 
look like them. They do not represent their interests or they do not, they will not be affected by the same policies because 50 years from now they will not be around. So I think that is an inst symbolic effect on young voters, leading them possibly to feel even more estranged to the system, leading them to become even less willing to participate or stand for elections. So I think we might risk having the younger generation feel that formal politics is not for them. So I think if the system is really interested in capturing a, a group of young uh, engaged people, uh, we must find ways for them to do so in parties. Otherwise they will find other arenas, I guess. May, may I add, I mean, a perfect example would be gun control in the States. I mean, even among young Republicans, there would, there would be uh, even young Republicans in the majority would favor, for example, the ban of automatic assault weapons. And young people in general, it's a very, very high percentage who would um, advocate for, for stricter gun laws. But the same percentages we don't have among the older cohorts of the population. That's why nothing changes. I mean, if um, young people in a, an ideal world would have a much bigger share, would be in, in much would have a much more to say. I mean, I, I think there would be a higher chance that gun, gun laws would change. And it's one of the main issues in the States to just highlight. And um, and also to add the second point, we label this in the in the book, The Vicious Cycle of Political Alienation, because we um, it's kind of, I mean, young people don't participate. Hence, parties have not a real interest to cater to the needs of young people. Um, and, and, and hence, they're not uh, a lot of, uh, not represented. And this creates then even bigger cynicism, cynicism among young people. So it's kind of a of, of a vicious cycle. And, uh, and of course, they also don't participate in equal numbers. Hence, parties have even a bigger incentive to, to cater to the wishes of older people. So this is this is where we are right now. I mean, there are some signs that this this, this changes, but uh, not large scale. And, and, and that's why we also see, I would say, a lot of non-conventional forms of activism by young people, because the conventional means are just closed or there's just very little chance to 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 uh, to navigate there and to, to have an impact because the 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 the, the, the structure is just uh, closed up for them right now and this is very difficult to I mean to change this yeah and that that brings me to the to the final point the debate that you you touch on there this idea that young people are just politically you know not interested they're disengaged versus no no they are engaged but they are seeking alternative or, or non conventional ways to um to be politically active because they don't feel at home in in what is currently available to them um at Inter Paris, of course, we we very strongly believe in in the need for young people to participate formally in in politics, and in our case, of course, that means in in parliaments and in, in formal institutions. Um, you've already uh, stated here that you uh, that you agree with that, but let me just read uh, what you quote in the book, because I think this is really important. You state that voting in elections is still one of the most established forms of political action. Um, parties remain the main political actors and parliaments and cabinets remain the places where laws are drafted, decided and implemented. Therefore, it matters where youth participate and it is worrying that young adults tend to opt out from established channels of participation. Um, we completely agree with that, of course, but that begs one very important question uh, and something that we at Inter Paris hope to address. Uh, and that is how do parliaments meet young people halfway? What what can be done to establish that that engagement or that re-engagement, however you choose to look at it? That's what we hope to focus on in the next few years. So as a final question to both of you, um, what would you like to say to the members and the staff um, that we work with uh, and that might be using uh, these resources that might be working with us in the next few years? What would you advise them to do? I, I guess if we think of a support network for those already elected, I think obviously they are so competent and they have their own stuff, but we actually find when we survey candidates or sorry, representatives that young legislators feel at oftentimes that they are belittled, that they don't get the same responsibility, that they are treated as very young individuals without the same kind of authority. So I guess that would be the obvious um, that we would like to really highlight that there is an equal treatment of all legislators, uh, irregardless of their age. And I guess second, and maybe this is outside the parliament, um, to support those running for office. I think we find 
across countries that uh, those places where youth wings are able to gather support for individual candidates and where youth wings are stronger in a party, we find that young candidates from that cluster faces a better uh, success rate, so to say. So, so I guess that is also something that needs to be built from below to support young candidates. Daniel? I mean, I would add raise awareness because I'm not even sure. And I think that's what I have a little bit in Canada that most representatives are aware of the problem. I mean, just ask them, what's the age of, I mean, how representative is parliament in, in terms of age? And I, 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 I'm not sure if you, you, you will get real answers. So, and then also make it clear that, you know, there's this argument that everyone's turn will come. So there's no discrimination of youth because when they're older, they have their, they, 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 they have their, um, their say. But to, to also make it very clear that young people as a group have distinct interests these distinct in interests are legitimate and they need to have a channel to voice them. And since there's also a lot of research coming out now that says that really shows that yes, younger people are more spokesperson of younger people's interests, climate change, gun control, um, and, and, uh, tuition um, reduction, mm -hmm. name, name the topics. It is important that they are there. And so I, 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 and I mean, I think this is for me, the sensitized parliaments sensitize individual MPs, sensitize parties that, yeah, this is an issue. This is an issue regardless of where you stand. And this is an issue of um, a basic principle of representation. And I think the awareness, as long as the awareness is not there, there won't be big changes. And as long as the, 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 the and also in society, society needs, I mean, Society needs to also be aware, or, or, or I mean, implicitly they are, but explicitly they say, "Hey, here are some issues with you, and here are how these issues are not addressed, and this is what it leads to." So I mean, a real, I mean, this real big campaigns of sensitization, and I mean, another big thing I would say, which is probably the most doable reform in this time, would be term limits. I mean, because quotas, I think, no chance. But I think term limits could be something. Uh, it, it could also be put in the broader uh, sense to 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 to. It would a way to 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 combat corruption. It's a way to bring in new ideas. It's a way to re revitalize the par like parliament. So even if, if at all you want to advocate for anything institutional, I would say term limits doesn't need to be necessarily two, but three or four seems to be very appropriate and I think implicitly young people would benefit from it. Well that's very clear and a number of things on our to-do list uh, for the years to come. Um, Axel and Daniel thank you very much first of all for the for the work that you've done as you say uh, there's a real gap here so having people such as yourselves doing the research and making it publicly available uh, no less uh, for us to benefit from uh, is hugely helpful and from our side we hope that we can nudges at least a little bit closer, um, Daniel, towards a slightly more maybe positive medium-term medium outlook uh, than you currently have in the years to come. 